Well, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you may be at. We are live right now, first live stream by Public Bank Institute. So welcome, everybody, wherever you may be at. We have some very important topic to talk about today for initial live stream uh, here. But uh, with us, we have two very important guests. And our subject today will be, uh, of course, uh, postal banking. Uh, as you know, things are roughed up right now. Everywhere across America, people are suffering. Uh, our cities are desperate. Uh, money is tight. And this is why this subject is very important because it will tie us up with some of the solutions that uh, cities need to take uh, into consideration. Uh, but I would like to introduce uh, some of our guests tonight. Uh, today, we have, of course, Ellen Brown. She is the founder of Public Banking Institute, also an author. Uh, Ellen Brown, welcome. Thanks, Carlos. Yes, and also we have with us Marsha. I can introduce myself. I'm Mersa Baradara. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Mersa? Yes. Thanks. Okay, having a little technical problems here. Can you hear? Uh, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah, we yes. Can hear you. We need to. We're waiting on Mersa again. She is. A law professor at UC well, she, Irvine. She's here. She I'm here. Knows, Carlos. I'm here. Okay. So welcome, both of you. <laughs> Thank and you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, of course, Ellen, this is a, a very important subject that we're going to try to dive into. We're not going to answer all the questions today, but we need to start the conversation, the conversation around postal banking. As many of you know, I'm also a postal employee. So this is very dear to me because, again, uh, right now, all the attention and all the focus is on the U.S. Postal Service. So there are some solutions as to, you know, how we can save the post office. Ellen, can you tell us a little bit about um, the work that, that you have done? I know you are also an author. But uh, so for those people that don't know you, maybe you want to uh, give a little introduction yourself of yourself uh, so that people may know a little bit about you. Okay. I'm chairman of the Public Banking Institute, and our goal is to get public bank, uh, state-owned, city-owned, whatever, uh, banks owned by local governments of some sort established across the country. And so we have a quite vibrant movement going right now. It was our... Public Banking Institute was founded in 1911. I have written three books on this subject, uh, 13 books altogether. So the three on this were Web of Debt, Public Bank Solution, and Banking on the People. And I've written hundreds of articles. <laughs> wow, great. Uh, Mirsa, uh, you have been very active and you're also a writer. And not only that, but you have introduced a a bill that actually has passed uh, along with Mark Armstrong, which also is one of the powerhouses of public banking. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you have been doing over the years? Um, sure. Yeah. So uh, the bill, I mean, it, it's passed. Uh, it, uh, Congress um, has passed, not not Senate. There hasn't been an effective bill. And, you know, it's been with the help of a lot of the members of the congressional staff. But, and again, for some um, reason, I cannot hear. So I'm hoping that uh, okay. Is, Can you hear me, she, Ellen? Uh, is she yeah, speaking yeah. right now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. You let um, me know when she's uh, through, please. <laughs> yeah, we can just talk to each other if you like. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that would be great. I mean. Okay. Take it away, Marissa. Okay. Yeah. So the idea is, you know, as uh, piggybacking off of uh, um, Ellen's uh, public banking work, is to use the post office, um, the footprint it already has, and and I actually should say that to it's it's a it's a um, a revisal of an idea that was already in place for many, many years in the United States and abroad. And the idea is that the post office would also be a bank. Again, we had postal banking in the United States from 1910 until 1966. And this is especially important now as you know, Congress is issuing, you know, $1,200 checks and unemployment or any, any 
sort of financial transaction that we want to get people access to. And um, there are increasingly banking deserts and just um, check cashers and payday lenders who charge per transaction. And so this is just a simple payment system operated by the post office. And of course, right now, um, uh, there was just yesterday a announcement or two days ago, an announcement that JP Morgan is considering partnering with the post office to provide these services. And I think, you know, it shows one that this is a good idea. <laughs> if JP Morgan thinks it's a profitable venture, it's a profitable, profitable venture. And two, um, how, uh, how uh, a, a monopoly could um, could you know form in a problematic way? You know, can you imagine how much more power J.P. Morgan would have here if it also had, besides its own size and, and capital, the footprint of the post office? And so the whole, whole idea of the postal banking and public banking and the public option is to allow uh, us to get around banks as as middlemen. Uh, right, agreed. Um, yeah. And of course, we've we've got the uh, banks have had a war on the post office, uh, the postal banking idea ever since it was founded, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, they're opposed now. And uh, th in fact, there's been a war on the post office itself, an attempt to privatize it for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, one one reason there they are struggling is because of a bill passed. I think it was in 2006 that. Uh, mm -hmm that said that the post office had to pay uh, for the health services of its employees 75 years into the future. So that includes mm -hmm. people that are not even hired or not even born yet, let alone hired. So, uh, mm -hmm. so they're totally disadvantaged by Congress. It's clear that there's an effort mm -hmm. to kill the post office. And in 2014, yeah. there was a, a proposal, a white paper by the inspector general at the post office that said, you know, this would be a way that we could actually make money and actually mm -hmm. be back in the black. Um, mm -hmm. He actually proposed things like taking over um, uh, uh, loans to actually do mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. something that would be competitive with mm -hmm. um, payday loans. Mm -hmm. And he calculated that it could be done at 28% versus like 400%, which is mm -hmm. what the payday lenders are lending at now. So that is, you know, clearly that's a would be competing with the big banks mm -hmm. because they fund the payday lenders and mm -hmm. it, it would be competing with their credit cards because, you mm -hmm. know, people that don't have money borrow mm -hmm. at 21 percent on their credit mm -hmm. cards or even small yeah. businesses are forced mm -hmm. to borrow on their credit cards instead of getting a reasonable. I mean, maybe eight percent or something would be reasonable. That's mm -hmm. what they used mm -hmm. to get in for small mm -hmm. and medium sized businesses. And now they're stuck with these credit cards. So clearly there's a, an effort to kill this mm -hmm. idea. And that's why we talk about it, to to show that this actually would be a very viable idea. We'd make money for the post office and it would serve the 25% or more of the economy that's unbanked or underbanked. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's fascinating that you have uh, the, um, you know, banks being opposed to it. And then all of a sudden uh, you find out that they're secretly in talks to actually do the work. And then, you know, there's a, there's a op-ed today in American Banker where after the JP Morgan announcement, the credit unions who have been totally opposed to public banking through the post office saying, oh, well, don't be, don't go with JP Morgan, go with us and we can do this as well. So it's not really a fundamental opposition. It's, it's about them having um, their territory, even though, as you, you just said, um, there's a whole wide swath of the population that banks aren't serving, credit unions aren't serving because it's not profitable. The areas are in you know, rural areas or in inner city areas where banks just prefer not to be. And so the whole idea was to fill in these gaps um, at a profit, at a small marginal profit to the post office. And I'll, actually on that note, David Williams, who was the author of the that report that you just mentioned, the inspector general report, was um, testifying yesterday. He was um, appointed to be the, on the board of directors of the post office, actually, and trying to get this through. Um, the unions uh, selected him and he resigned um, because, um, as he revealed yesterday, um, that the Treasury, especially Steve Mnuchin, was very much involved in trying to kind of defund the post office and, and get um, the postmaster general, general out and get this uh, Trump donor um, in. And so he, he kind of resigned out of that frustration and protest. Yeah, that's too bad he resigned. I mean, we need people in there fighting, but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. even in the 1930s, it was particularly, which was a situation like what we have today, where um, mm -hmm. 
you know, people were out of work and desperate and the banks themselves were bankrupt. Of course, they're not bankrupt mm -hmm. now because we mm -hmm. underwrote them. But what mm -hmm. uh, the Roosevelt government could have done in the 1930s was to support the uh, the postal banking system. So we already mm -hmm. had a public banking system and it was mm -hmm. all, all across the country. We have post offices all across, across the country. But instead, what we did was to award um, uh, deposit insurance to the private banks. So we, the people, mm -hmm. are now underwriting the private banking system. They get the profits and we bear mm -hmm. the liabilities and the losses. Mm -hmm. And we've mm -hmm. been bailing them out ever since. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's clearly a political issue. It's not mm -hmm. an issue of um, which would be more... Our argument is that clearly the public system would serve the people better and would save money overall for the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as you said, banks are already public. It's just they get private profits, and uh, but they're underwritten. Their risks, um, their deposits, and their loans. You know, there's guarantees on both sides, and so it's public banking is just essentially creating a public option where there's already so much public subsidies under the banking system. Right. So you've been speaking quite a bit about this. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you mm -hmm. take it and run with it. I think you probably have mm -hmm. some tidbits that, that I don't even know on this. Well, I mean, the back, I mean, I think um, it was one of those ideas, uh, the postal banking and, and uh, creating this public option was one of those ideas that was sort of out, out there, um, you know, in the realm of academia when I was first writing about it. But has since been adopted by um, some some uh, Democrats, so Bernie Sanders and, and Elizabeth Warren and and uh, Kristen Gillibrand and um, and then uh, you know several uh, Congress uh, uh, congressional members and 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 it has become part of the conversation and especially now that um, there's this an outright war on the post office um, and we are going to have to rely on postal voting by mail and other sort of just keeping the post office intact under the assault of this privatization. I think it's um, postal banking has been much more of a, of an option. And, and I think, you, you know, you talked about the 2006 bill about, um, you know, the, the debt that, the, that it gave the post office immediately. Um, they, they went into $6 billion of debt, right. With their um, pre-funding mortgage uh, 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 thing. But it also, um, that bill also did not allow the post office to innovate and change and add new products. And this is something that um, the post office has always been able to do. I mean, the post office, you know, goes back to before the constitution, it was the 1700s um, where um, the post office was created by you know, George Washington, Ben Franklin, James Madison created, you know, nationwide um, roads and rails and, and really um, uh, was the basis of the democracy. And, um, over time, there has been many technological changes, obviously, since the 1700s, you have know, railroads, um, air mail, uh, you know, going from uh, old, you know, the old world um, into the new, the, the way that, you know, the country expanded and just technology and the post office has always been able to adapt and change and adopt new technologies and just um, move forward. And uh, what the 2006 bill, and then er, you know, in the 1970s too, um, the the co Congress and Republicans did was to basically, um, with with the Democrats not really putting up too much of a fight, I should say, um, is to basically um, start the slow process of defunding and de delegitimizing, and ultimately their end game is to privatize. And I think um, this is where we're at right now, which is that. They're uh, purposefully trying to um, make it unprofitable and um, seem to be, uh, you know, failing uh, institution where, you know, it has been able to adapt over time, but now it's not uh, allowed to by law. Um, so I think that's a big problem. Um, so, so, you know, postal banking is one added revenue stream. Um, and not only would it save the post office, I actually come at it from the, the point of where you do, which is public banking. We already have a public banking system uh, that leaves out a whole bunch of people. And there's there are just obvious ways to plug in that gap. And it doesn't have, in, from, my, from the inclusion point, it doesn't have to be public. It doesn't have to be postal banking. It could be any public banking. It could be state or local or just, you know, straight, you know, through the Federal Reserve, the post office makes sense uh, because it has brick and mortar locations. It is a um, federal government institution. It is uh, not, it's a not-for-profit, so it doesn't 
it's not profit oriented, doesn't have shareholders. Um, so in that way, it made sense, but it could be any, any public organization that does this. Yeah. And the big advantage of the post office, of course, is the infrastructure. They could, they, mm-hmm. you don't have to buy a bunch mm-hmm. of post offices. They're everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they, they also have- already do cash. They already give money orders. So they have that back end security, cash security. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you've written a book on it. Do you want to tell us about your book? Yeah. So the book, you know, starts with um, a history of other um, uh sort of movements in banking that were, you know, populist and progressive and had these uh, banks for the people, right? So credit unions and thrift and buildings and loans and the savings banks that were philanthropic and and how over time and as the progressive era sort of turned into the neoliberal era, these, all of these sectors, credit unions, thrift, and the community banks turned into for-profit mega banks. And then the mergers kind of swept in. So this is, you know, bank mergers and these bank like mega banks like JP Morgan are relatively new. I mean, JP Morgan was a investment bank in the you know um, 1900s and and even in the 1950s, and now it is a bank bank because it's been able to merge. You know, their investment arm was able to merge with its deposit taking and loan making arm, where those used to be separate. And so this idea that we've got now five banks that control not just the entire investment banking sector, so market trading, but also deposit taking and lending, that's incredibly new that is that was not allowed before and so as that has happened as as you you have explained also you know they've merged they've left a whole bunch of um uh, people which who don't have the money to to um make their uh make it worth it for the banks to cater to them and um communities where the branches just aren't viable and they aren't profitable um so as communities have lost their banks uh, you've had payday lenders and check cashers um fill in that void. And the payday lenders and check cashers are financed by the same Wall Street banks. It's a very profitable business. There's basically at the same time as we let banks merge, we also deregulated usury caps. So there's barely any caps on interest rates anymore um, after the 1978 um, Marquette decision. Um, So you can charter a bank now in Utah or Idaho without any usury cap, which is the interest rate cap, and uh, export your interest rates all over the country. And so since that has happened, payday lending has blossomed and really taken up where community banks and credit unions used to be. And so as I kind of studied that history, I had expected that my answer would also be, you know, maybe community banks or re reinvigorate. And I, I think at some point I got um, to the realistic um, sort of conclusion that this is, it's already the cat's out of the bag on that. Like you can't, you know, make make America, uh, you know, the place where we had these tiny banks and the best way to do it would be through public banking, um, uh, specifically, you know, um, uh, postal banking uh, as or or any sort of like uh, retail banking that would provide those um, services at a low cost. Okay. And uh, so David Duck, I see, ask uh, the name of your book, The Color of Money. Do you want to yeah. say what the title it implies? Actually, or what that point yeah. Is? Actually, the, the book that I wrote about postal banking is called How the Other Half Banks um, in 2015. That's when I met Ellen, I think, early on uh, in a public banking panel. So, so my book on postal banking is called How the Other Half Banks, and it goes through that history of the credit unions and savings and loans and, and the payday lending, the rise of payday lending, and then ends with a proposal for postal banking. And I wrote that book in, I think, 2015, uh, wrote an article on postal banking in 2012. So, you know, it's been a while, and it's one of those things that it, took a long time, I think, for people to realize, oh, we've lost our banks. And by the way, since the financial crisis, it's gotten worse. You know, there's more communities now without a bank than there were even 10 years ago. Um, the second book is called The Color of Money. And that that, that book is actually quite different. It's about um, the racial wealth gap and um, the uh, black banking sector and how that segregation patterns have, have really um, uh, affected the ability of black banks. And, and I wrote that book to actually demonstrate kind of using one example how about how banking um is federal right if you look at or and federal and public if you look at black banks and, and the way they've been left out of this entire federal loan structure um early in the 1930s until ba- basically the end of the civil rights era and even till today you really see how you can't have banks outside of that system creating wealth and providing access to communities if they're not plugged into the federal um, federal reserve uh, the FDIC insurance fund and all of the the sort of 
you know, wealth creating loan programs. So. Yeah. And what what we have, it's so obvious right now, we've got two, two economies. We've got the financialized Mm -hmm. economy and the real economy where the unbanked, the underbanked, the small and Mm medium-sized businesses trade and the, and the financialized economy has Mm -hmm. taken over the Mm -hmm. pocket of the federal reserve. I mean, they just printed trillions of dollars Mm -hmm. to bail out the stock market and the big corporations. But when we, the states, have asked Mm -hmm. for some portion, we wind up with a a loan, um, well, Mm -hmm. it's uh, the special special purpose vehicle that Mm -hmm. lends at a penalty, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. market rates plus a penalty. So that's what we get, whereas the banks get to borrow at 0.25%. So that's why I think we need our own banks. We need to get into that system so that we, the states or cities, can also borrow at 0.25%. Yeah, and the point of, of 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 supporting banks is that they'll pass it on to their customers, and and they're not right. They're actually just enriching shareholders. And so, uh, why do we need a middleman if they're not actually serving us or passing along these savings? And the whole point of all of these subsidies that we created was this: the banks had this duty, and there was a time where they actually did do their duty because they had no choice, right? There were interest rate caps and lots of regulations, and now once we deregulated. We do, they don't have a duty, and so they are going to keep all of the monetary policy goodies that they get and the, the uh, guarantees that they get and then choose their customers. And so absolutely, public banking is, uh, is a way for us to just kind of equalize the playing field. Yeah. Uh, so in, in March, when the Federal Reserve changed the rules on the banks and, and they let all banks uh, borrow at the discount window, no penalty, virtually for free. And mm-hmm. uh, got rid of the dep- uh, the reserve requirement, et cetera. And their their reasoning was that this was supposed to help because the businesses mm-hmm. were struggling, you know, the small mm-hmm. businesses, and this would help mm-hmm. lending. That lending wasn't happening, and this would encourage yeah. lending, but it mm-hmm. hasn't. They mm-hmm. haven't, pa- like you say, they haven't passed down those benefits, and that mm-hmm. obviously was not the real reason. The real reason mm-hmm. was to bail out the Fed itself, which mm-hmm. was bailing out the banks through the repo market, and that it was getting. Mm-hmm really expensive so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That, all right yeah. come borrow from yeah. us directly but yeah, that's yeah. Thing. we all should be able to borrow directly from mm-hmm. the central bank mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah but, and we should you know because we have uh you know the fdic insurance system and all of these systems that that are for depositors and for you know the, the loans of lenders and um Banks were supposed to be stewards of both both sides of that, both the deposits and these loans. And now they're just doing much more than deposit taking and loan making. And so their interests actually are in the bigger deals. And you saw this with the PPP program, right? So you have this program where Congress says we've you know billions of dollars, and all you have to do actually is just process these applications um, for small businesses. And the banks just didn't. They the big banks refused to do it for. Um, Customers that they didn't have outstanding relation or profitable, I should say, relationships with, because they didn't even do it for their small customers. And to the point, to the customers that they did do it for, they only did it if it was worth their while. And so I think this is it was like a microcosm of the the general problem with banking writ large, which is that you actually have this government program that's supposed to like go through banks as a middleman, and the middlemen get to decide who they give it to or not. I mean, the money's coming from the government, the businesses are supposed to get it, and the middlemen are just like actually causing problems and seeking rent from both sides, right? They're like, we won't do it. The first, you know, uh, the first congressional uh, ask was, you know, will you do it under these circumstances? And they're like, no. And then they got what they wanted from Congress. And then on this side, they still chose their customers. They just still chose who they were gonna give these loans to. And so I think that's exactly kind of highlighting the problem that has been over the last several decades, which is, they they get these goodies and then they get to choose who they give them to and and why why are we doing this why not just cut out the middleman yeah and you can see the same thing if i can switch mm-hmm. subjects with the vaccines where the vaccine yeah. maker said the government said we want you yeah. to make vaccines yeah. and they said well we can't do it because we can't make a safe vaccine and so yeah. you know the liabilities are too great mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so we're not going to do it and so the government said okay we'll take the mm-hmm. we'll bear the liabilities so mm-hmm. here we are paying mm-hmm. for, I mean, the, so mm-hmm. that allows the drug companies to make, they don't really have to put money into even safety yeah. tests. I mean, they do a, a minimum minimum for show, mm-hmm. uh, but it it's is a problem with capitalism in general, that it's all about yeah. making profits for the investors 
And if they can cut corners, they will. And if they make, if they can make mm -hmm. shoddy products and get away with it, they will. And in mm -hmm. many cases, we're talking about lives and, you know, mm -hmm. the health of the people and the livelihoods mm -hmm. of the people. And, and exactly right. And I think this gets to the bigger problem that which we started with the post office, this idea that the, the like neoliberal or whatever kind of um, market fundamentalist idea that public markets can do everything better. And what you see with you know the post office and banking and vaccine making and healthcare is that private markets actually need you know, they'll, they'll do rent extraction or they will actually um, serve the needs of profits as opposed to people. And there are some things that the public just does better, public institutions, public banks, public um, vaccines. So I, I actually do want the government to be making vaccines um, because if we're taking the risks anyway, the government has to um, issue the sort of, you know, uh, the FDA has to do the protocol and then they're going to be the ones that underwrite the production and all of the stuff. Why not just also make the decisions, right? Why, why does Moderna, I mean, you know, we're still using the scientist knowledge. It's just through government grant making. We do a lot of things like this, but there's just like this myth out there that the private competition is going to make better ish, better things. And with some markets that doesn't work, um, maybe in some things it does, right? Certainly there's some products where you want people competing, but they're not essential to our lives, you know, um, I'm fine with sort of capitalists competing about who makes the best like water bottle, right? And then like whoever wins, I'll buy their water bottle and I'll pay a premium because it's like the best water bottle ever. But if we're talking about like healthcare and just access to like, you know, banking or mail, um, the government just has to do that because otherwise the competition will leave out people who are not profitable. They're just not going to sell to you that good because you're not, you don't have enough money. And we as a society just can't, can't have that in certain markets, right? Yeah, and so the, and in banking, we now know that banks actually create our money supply. So we're giving mm -hmm. away this power mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they do mm -hmm. it for profit and they only do mm -hmm. it for profit, but they're making a profit off the full faith and credit of the United States. I mean, the only reason they can do it is they're backed by the government. They've got the deposit insurance, et cetera. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing with healthcare that mm -hmm. uh, they actually have a vested interest to mm -hmm. not having people be healthy. You know, they're, they're, the real ideal for the drug companies is mm -hmm. somebody that has to take their medicines for 30 mm -hmm. years or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, keep them barely alive, but put them on a mm -hmm. lot of drugs, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So it's just, they're, mm -hmm. it's, like I say, they're, I mean, I read somewhere that all, all countries are 50% private and 50% public. It's just what you put in the public sector. And yeah, yeah, right. And and we've decided over time, you know, we make mortgages, you know, we let mortgages be public, essentially, where the public has to just underwrite the mortgage market, and then all healthcare is private. And the problem with private healthcare, as you said, is we actually don't negotiate, we can't pick the best option, we can't pick the lowest cost option, which is what how markets work, but it's like the worst of markets, right? We get the the companies that are just out to make a profit and we actually can't choose. So it, it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. The whole insurance thing is mm -hmm. yeah, we have no we have no leverage over that. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> what do we do about it? I mean I'm always I you know I always try to write something at the end of my articles, you know, this is the solution, yeah. this is what we can do. But now we are in such a mm -hmm. it's so difficult to say what the solution is. What what do you think? What <laughs> you know, I think um just this having to change the narrative of public versus private and to re-legitimize government institutions. I think there's this sense that all government is bad and bureaucratic and all markets are good and efficient uh, among some quarters. And I think there has to be some a rewriting of that narrative that government actually needs to do some things. And there's some things that government is much better equipped to handle than other things. I mean, we already do that with the military, right? We would never say, let's just have a private militia out there and we all can hire our own, you know, defense army. Like, obviously I don't believe that we should have the army that we have, but we all kind of agree that like, oh, it's better for the federal government to like have the army. Um, but we don't, we don't do that uh, with banking. We don't do that with um, healthcare. And these things are actually more vital, I think, to our um, livelihood. And so just um, retelling that narrative and demanding our public institutions. I mean, the public is us, right? So that's the difference is, you can't 
outvote the JP Morgan board, but hopefully we can outvote the treasury board. I mean, hopefully we'll see if we can do it, but um, that's, that's where public institutions come into place, especially if we're talking about state or local, they're supposed to be us. They're our representatives and we need to demand from them some services that otherwise they're not doing. Right. Well, th uh, this has been great. It's uh, I see we've mm -hmm. hit a half mm -hmm. hour. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Our moderator seems to have just been moderator. What do you what do you say? So thanks, uh, Mirza. Thanks. That was great. I, you're really fun thanks. to talk to. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me, Ellen. It's always there good is, to talk. There's definitely so much that uh, that we can continue to talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great start of the conversation for many people that are just turning in now. You know, um, and some of you, perhaps this is the first time you hear about public banking, postal banking, and how it relates to the current issues. I think it's going to be very important for us to continue this conversation, to educate the public, to educate ourselves, because the answer right now to a lot of the problems, a lot of the financial ills, you know, that our government uh, has, our states you know, some of the answers rely on, you know, should be on public banking. Public banking has a lot to offer and some of the great things that you have learned here today. And we'll continue this conversation. We're going to have great guests in the coming future. And we hope that you continue to stay tuned to Public Banking Institute. We want to say thank you to Mersa for being with us. Thank Ellen. You. you know, you're amazing. You're a warrior. And again, uh, public banking is not going to go away. More and more uh, states are tuning in and are learning, you know, how they can benefit by being able to have public banking. In this case, the post office, you know, has a a history on public banking in the past. Mm -hmm. And we need to bring that back and, and expand on that. Okay. Any final great. words? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, very stimulating conversation <laughs> to me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Marissa, any final words? Oh, um, no, thank you for having me. This is great. I'm glad that you guys are raising awareness of these issues broadly. So thank you for having me. Okay. Likewise. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and hope you share these videos with your friends and hope to uh, you stay tuned.